and welcome to the program. Great to see you over there in Perth. And here we are again on Zoom. Great. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you for having me. Um, let's just talk a little bit about you. I, I want to know that, so you're a graduate of the West Australian School of Mines and mm -hmm. you've had extensive experience really across the whole value chain in the mining sector. Why trig mining and why potash? What excites you about this particular sector? Well, it goes right back to really when I was a teenager traveling and camping in the outback and coming across the bounded mines and thinking they were pretty exciting to explore as a kid, but also thinking that there could be a better way of doing things and being a little bit more respectful to our country. So my purpose really when I set out to become a mining engineer is to build mines communities can be proud of. So when I started Trigg, that is our purpose. And as you said, it's named after Henry Trigg, who quite clearly had purpose when he arrived in the Swan River settlement, which was essentially swamp land when he turned up and to help build that infrastructure and create systems and, and really build the fabric of what Perth is today. So that's what we're doing with Trig. It's about building mines communities can be proud of. And sulfate of potash suits that to a T because it's a, an organic fertilizer that's essential for our food security. It provides potassium, which is, exists in every living cell in our bodies. And the way we can produce it from the salt lakes without even interrupting the geological deposition because they're still current is through solar evaporation. So we're utilizing nature's um, energy source to produce ultimately an organic product. So is this something that you knew about for a while? I mean, um, are there other people in, in this sector as well? Uh, um, so potash is used in farming. Mm -hmm. How do they, and, and your one is organic. How, what do farmers do right now? In Australia, we import all of our potash and there's two types of potash. One's called muriate of potash and the other is sulfate of potash. The muriate comes from big, deep underground mines and it's potassium chloride. So for every tonne of the potassium of the fertiliser that the farmers are putting on their crops, they're putting half a tonne of chloride, which contributes to the salinity. And a lot of crops are really sensitive to chloride. And in fact, many crops cannot tolerate it. So all of your leafy green vegetables, your tree nuts, your fruit trees, grapes, cocoa beans, coffee beans, everything that's pretty tasty, and highly nutritious has to have sulfate of potash to be produced. So it's really important uh, as part of our agricultural supply chain and currently we import both muriate and sulfate of potash. Where do we import it from? Uh, so muriate often from Canada, Russia and Belarus right. and sulfate of potash it's not quite clear where a lot of that is coming from but perhaps some of it's coming from the large Mannheim processes in uh, China and other parts of the world because we're not really getting a lot of our hands on this, the organic sulfate of potash. So the alternative way, because we're not making enough from organic sources, is this Mannheim process where they put it in a big autoclave, heat it to around 800 degrees, pressurise it, add in sulfuric acid to provide the sulfur to muriate of potash, create an ion exchange, and then the, the waste product becomes hydrochloric acid. So for every tonne of sulfate of potash that's manufactured, it's 1.2 tonnes of hydrochloric acid that needs to be dealt with. Right, okay, so you've got a lot of waste product with those. So, so that's not great for the environment either. Not at all. Why are we 100% why are we importing if we have resources here in Australia? Why haven't we, we attacked this before, do you think? I think we just haven't considered the, the existence of minerals in the water. Coming from the WA School of Mines, my education was very much about hard rock mining. Open pit underground, I was passionate about underground mining, managed open pits, and in fact, dewatered a lot of these paleo channel systems to get to the gold deposits lying underneath them. We always considered total dissolved solids as just salt and waste, and we needed a discharge solution on another salt lake to manage that volume of water, but without really considering that the minerals in that water are electrolytes. And some of those electrolytes are, in fact, necessary fertiliser for our food supply. So it is quite new, yeah. So this is, a, is, a, this is a, a whole new industry that's coming up, which will help the Australian farming industry, which I've always said, Australia, you know, minerals and farming, that's, that's who we are. Yeah, one of my hashtags when I post things on social media is mining for farmers. 
mining for farm love it love it love it because lots of people say mining is bad for farming well ladies and gentlemen here you go yeah I'm telling you right now we're talking to somebody who is doing great things for farmers because it's organic and i i guess no is there any waste there is waste uh as such being um halite or sodium chloride so table salt table salt doesn't have a high value so you can't really transport it very far and still make money so what will happen is the salt, the sodium chloride will stay in the salt system within the salt lake. And the, the minerals that do have that economic value being the potassium and the sulfate that combine to produce sulfate of potash, that's, that's the primary product that we'll be looking to produce at our projects. So it is exciting. I mentioned earlier that you only uh, listed in October last year. And then of course, we had the thing that no one wants to talk about, the dreaded C word. Yeah. Um, has that impacted you moving forward? I know there's some there's some exciting things we're about to talk about, ladies and gentlemen. But have you has it had some impact on you in the last few months? It did. So we are in an area of Western Australia that has traditional owners called the Nudungara people, and their council was part of the um, Indigenous community lockdown from the federal government back in March. So collectively, we agreed to not enter country to make sure that we look after our vulnerable communities. So we put a pause on our exploration plans, but we kept working on everything in the background and communicating with everybody. We're now in that place where Western Australia has done a great job at very closely to eradicating COVID for now. And yeah. we're um, able to head back out there. So we announced just the other day that subject to the POW approval, we're out there and we'll be doing some heli supported drilling across the player and the, the surface of the Salt Lake. Well, for, and for those of you that are wondering what POW is, it's not oh. prisoner of war, it's program of works. Just <laughs> yeah. to, just to make, I know, you know, we, we tend to talk sometimes in jargon and I know that the platform that we're putting this out on, some people will go, what is that? So. I just like to, to mention that. So we've set the scene. You're about to start exploration out there. So is this, is, how did you come across this particular project and this particular location? Well, back when I started TRIG with my purpose to build mines, communities can be proud of, I looked at many projects and came across two projects with two West Australian geologists that had uh, two tenements, one across Lake Raisin and the other across the Lake across Lake Throssell. And Lake Throssell was the most exciting one, but Lake Raisin was already granted, so we started work on that. And it, yeah, it's, we pretty much built it up from there. So all the additional tenements that we've had since then have been applied for, and just one at Lake Raisin we've done a deal. So it's been a very economical startup to what could be a really substantial project at Throssell. Well, let's talk about Lake Throssell and let's talk about, and you say it's a startup because you're absolutely right. You're only just getting started. And I think for the investment community, and by the way, this is not investment advice. Do your own research. You know the rules. Um, but we're talking about there are other people in this area, but you guys, it's the exploration upside. It's the potential of what you potentially are looking at at Lake Throssell. So let's expand on that a little bit more and why you're so excited about this particular project and when the drilling is going to start. Yes, well, all, all from all the indications has been that Throssell with the acid gypsum index, which talks about the, the amount of salinity that's there in the lake, potential for potassium has had us always very excited. In December, we went out there and followed that up. We just after the listing process with some hand auger sampling, which took us down to two metres that all the water across the surface of the lake came back with really great grades and some very high grades. So it's looking like a really a high grade project. And we're now following that up with some deeper holes across, across the player. So we'll be drilling down to 12 metres, up to 12 metres in this program. And ultimately the next, well, not ultimately, but the next program after that will be an off-layer air core program. And that will be targeting the patio channel. So the ancient riverbed that has fed the minerals into the system. So the salt lakes are formed by draining really large areas. Throssell is at the terminus of a huge drainage system that comes in from the Gibson Desert. And over millions of years, it's dissolved the potassium rich rocks in the desert, carried it down the channel to the lakes where up to three metres of evaporation every year occurs, taking the water away and concentrating the minerals in the system. 
So is this, you said you've gone down two metres. Do you think that this system is going to be quite deep because of the length of time that the, it's been there and, it, and the mineralisation has been occurring? It could be. We just don't yet know how deep that paleo channel is until we can get one of those deeper holes in it. Uh, elsewhere uh, at our Lake Raisin project, we've drilled down to 100 metres. And the beauty of these projects is the mineralisation occurs just below the surface. So as soon as you hit water, and it doesn't take very long to hit the water in the salt lakes, even though we're talking about being in the desert, there is a lot of water out there and it goes all the way down to the bottom of that ancient riverbed system. So they're, they're substantial projects. And what about from a, I guess, um, looking at it from an environmental um, situation, it's just a great big salt lake. Are there any issues that you've got to overcome when it comes to, I guess, you know, it's early stage. We're at the exploration stage, ladies and gentlemen. So we're not going into mining just yet. We're exploring. But yep. do you have any challenges when it comes to the exploration side of it? Any uh, environmental challenges? Well, on the Salt Lake, we're not, uh, especially with the helicopter, we're fl literally flying the rig onto the lake, excuse me, <coughs> and dropping it down, or not dropping it, placing it down. <laughs> <coughs> and putting, putting a 12 metre hole in it. So it is really light impact at this stage. The other aspects of exploration when we'll be drilling off the lake is air core, um, low impact tracks going in and um, drilling. So it's not at this, at, particularly at this early stage, it is quite low impact. The, the overall impact for these projects mean that now, there's no open pit. Right. To me, that's particularly important because you're not leaving this massive scar that will never change in the landscape. The water is what will be pumping out and the impact on the environment will come when we put evaporation ponds either on the lake or off the lake of the project. Some of the peers are looking, are able to put them on lake, others need to keep them off the lake. But in keeping them off the lake, it's all about lining and managing that saline, that saline water to ensure that we do protect the environment. And then the rehabilitation ultimately at the end of a, a, one of these projects is essentially flattening those dams, taking your process plant away and leaving the, the lake go back to nature. So without the open pit and the big waste, the rock waste dump there, it's, it overall is quite low impact. So you've got a, 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 I think we can, are we allowed to say what's happening next week, do you think? This is quite exciting, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm putting it on, Karen. Can we say what's happening next week? Well, we, we will be drilling next week. That's that's what's most exciting. I put her on the spot. So you're drilling next week. So actually, that's you're back at it. Um, yep. So so tell us about that drilling program. What's what can investors? Because that's that's when things start to get exciting. When the when the drill get when the drill rig gets out there, and yep. you can start to find out what it is that you've actually got, rather than you know, you've done you've done some some homework, but now we're getting into the nitty gritty. Yes, well, it's the first program, as I said, the helicopter supported rig will drill down to about twelve meters, and that's just to test the the superficial sediment, so the very shallow uh, horizon where there'll be quite possibly a lot of water and really good flow rates, and we'll be looking for the potassium mineralization and the sulfate mineralization, and getting a good understanding of what we can pump out of that part of the lake. So we'll be doing about 24 holes right across the lake surface at Throssell. And happy, and sorry, just, just, to, just for a visual, and, I, and, and we've got the map here now. Yep. How big are we looking at? What, what's the size of this? This granted tenement is just over 300 square kilometres. Wow, that's huge. Yep. And you're putting 24, 24 holes in? Yep. And what sort of spacing? Uh, quite substantial spacing given that, but also being a water resource, we don't need to have a very tight pattern to understand it in quite great detail. And then it really is, the, main, the large volume is likely to come from the paleo channel lying underneath it. So we're, we're doing this in a stage process, an economical process to right. target that paleo channel. So the next round of drilling after that will be this uh, off-light air core, and that will give us a, a lot of information around the scale of what we could have there at Throssell. Also want to say that we haven't been sitting around waiting to do just this one program. After we listed last year, 
we raced out of the starting blocks and drove right across Lake Raisin. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah, so let's talk about Lake Raisin um, because you've done some work over there, haven't you? So what's, what's that told you? Yes, well, before listing, we did our first drill program. You can see one of the photos there of when we're on the lake at Lake Raisin. And after listing, we followed that up with a bit more drilling and announced our main resource at Raisin. So we've identified up to about 6 million tonnes of sulphate of potash exists just in that late raising project on its own. Uh, and so where does that sit in, your, where does Lake Raisin sit in your development plans against Throssell? Well, Throssell grade is looking like it's going to be three times higher. And Throssell sits on the Great Central Road, which is being bitumized and upgraded. And that is planned to be a trade route between Western Australia and cutting through the Northern Territory and into Queensland. So we've got really great infrastructure at Throssell. So we're looking at Throssell being the base point, our main production centre, and then Raisin becoming part of that, the, lo the longer mine life, the, the just a, I suppose a satellite project to Lake Throssell. And in terms of the market, and I know, look, this is, this is very early, um, but we talked earlier about the fact that um, uh, the, the potash industry is all imported at the moment for our Australian farmers, but we do have an industry that is starting to really come alive and it's Australian owned and it's on Australian land, which is exciting. Um, is there, is, what's the market like? Is, is there a big market and will, will there be a flooding of the market with so much coming on stream or is there enough demand that there's no issue with supply? Globally, we're only producing about a third of the world's needs from brine sources. The rest of it needs to come from what I describe as those chemical processes. Right. So already there is plenty of room in the global market. The global market's about 7 million tonnes per annum and growing at about 3%. So we need one or two of these new projects every year to meet global demand. In Australia, yes, we're importing all of it. And I would love to see we us keep as much of the sulphate of potash as we can in Australia and economically value add to that and export it in grains or any of our other food food products that we're exporting. Actually, I love, I love that term, value add. It's my favorite term. When you say value add, um, are you saying that, so, so the, the base potash, if you like, you can then, um, we can value add to our grains and our wheats and things. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. So if we think about our um, food export products as being minerals, which is why we eat food is for, for minerals for our health, is it's really just an exchange in form. So we can't eat the sulfate of potash, but we can certainly eat the grain that it produces, or we can eat the, the lettuce or the grapes or the avocados and things like that that's produced from the sulfate of potash. So in my, in my mind's eyes, it's about in, improving our agricultural practices, reducing our reliability on imports and creating more sustainable agriculture here in Australia, as well as creating that value, that economic value out of the product on the way through before it gets exported. Well, Karen, it sounds to me like you've, you've really come, you, you, you've got a passion for this. That's, that's coming through loud and clear. What can investors expect in the next two months? It sounds to me like you've got a lot going on and a yep. lot of news flow. So let's just summarise what investors should look for over the next two to three months, because you really haven't been on the radar. And, and uh, I think it's a very, very exciting time for, for Trig Mining. So what can we expect? Well, we've got this helicopter supported program. The assay results from that will get an idea of the sands and the pore space and and specific yield of the superficial sediments. We're doing an infill gravity program. Just before COVID, we got a couple of lines in just off the lake before everyone needed to come back to base. So we're going back out there to complete that across the lake. So that'll be the first time we'll have a full gravity picture across the paleo channel system. And then the off lake air core drilling. So we'll have a couple of dozen holes of that as well. And that's targeting that the base of that paleo channels will have a quite possibly with all of these results, we anticipate we'll be able to announce an inferred resource later in the year. Wow, you're moving fast, which is really yep. exciting. Well, congratulations. It sounds like a really interesting project. You've got a lot on your plate. Really appreciate you spending the time 
talking with small caps today. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Carrie.